All right. Let's get going here. Well, welcome to the few uh, early souls. Well, I guess you're not early. You're technically on time. But for the few people that are going ahead and uh, joining the webinar here, welcome. My name is Luke, and um, I'm going to just give a few minutes to allow people to start trickling in here. Um, but um, if you don't mind, go ahead and throw in the chat box where you're from just so we can have something to uh, to do while we wait here. But yeah, I'm interested where, uh, where in the country I'm talking to. All right. Fairfield, Connecticut. Okay. SF Bay Area. Well, Collective is a San Francisco company. So uh, you're at the right place here. Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. I actually went there last year for uh, one of my company offsite uh, meetings and uh, I had to sleep for three days afterwards. So it's a, it's a, it's a fun town. Okay. People from California. All right. And Illinois. Okay. Well, I'm originally from your, I guess, neck of the woods. I'm from Southeast Missouri. So uh, I know all about the, the middle of the country. Let's just say that. Okay, well, I think we've got enough people in to where I can go ahead and get started with things. But, um, well, first of all, um, welcome. I'm so, uh, so happy to have you guys here and uh, get ready. We're getting ready to talk about the most riveting, most interesting topic uh, most people's favorite topic, taxes. That's what this webinar is about. Um, but seriously, let's just kind of get some um, housekeeping uh, rules taken care of here. For one, I believe that we've got two sets of chat boxes for this webinar. We've got a Q&A chat box, and we also just have a, have a regular chat box. For things like technical difficulty, technical difficulties or like logistical issues, um, like if you have trouble with the sound or anything like that, throw anything like that in the chat box, if you don't mind. But there's also a Q&A box. And at the end of this webinar, I will answer your questions to the best of my ability. Um, and for those, any sort of tax questions, questions about collective, anything like that, throw those in the Q&A box. And I will get to them at the, uh, the end of the webinar. And uh, for one, let's just get the uh, the legal stuff out of the way. For one, technically, this is just an information session. You know, don't consider this, you know, like active um, tax advice or you know legal advice. Um, you know, this is pretty complicated stuff. So, you know, before you do anything, like before you take any action, like based on this information, speak to a CPA, a tax attorney, you know, or some sort of tax professional before you do anything. Um, but also, just. Um, just a reminder that this webinar replay will be sent out um, via email to you in 24 hours. So if you got to leave early or if you miss any part of it, um, don't worry, it'll it'll um, be sent out to you. But I think I've got enough of that stuff taken care of where I think we can go ahead and start. Well, here's the agenda. For one, taxes you face when you're self-employed. You know, what is it when you're self-employed, what sort of additional taxes do you have? You know, what What do you got to do to pay those taxes? That, uh, we'll discuss that. How S-Corps can help you, help you make taxes less of a burden. Um, you know, essentially, for most people, S-Corps lower the amount of taxes you pay. So, of course, we'll start that. We'll discuss that. How to estimate your taxes. You know, when you're self-employed, uh, it's less straightforward to pay your taxes and to figure out how much you even owe. So, we'll discuss that. And, of course, you know, I'm a employee of collective so we're going to talk about how collective makes taxes a no-brainer and then at the end like i mentioned we'll have some q a's for one collective we're the first all-in-one platform that's designed you know specifically for self-employed people before us you'd usually need to have you know a separate cpa over here and 
know, some sort of bookkeeping software or a bookkeeper over there and, you know, just several professionals to handle your taxes and finances. But Collective provides all of that in one company, in one spot. When you're self-employed, you deal, you deal with a lot of stuff. And um, I can say this because, you know, I am a, a W-2 employee. It's harder to run your taxes when you're self-employed versus a W-2 employee. So you got to estimate your taxes. How do you even do that? You have to pay more in self-employment taxes. You pay less in those type, type of taxes when you're a W-2 employee. Uh, how do you figure out what you can deduct for your business? That's always complicated, what you can and can't write off. Surprise tax bills at the end of the year. And I think that that is probably one of the most, I guess, you know, more, more terrifying areas of business is owing the government a ton of money at the end of the year. And, you know, unfortunately, I've spoken to, you know, these countless, you know, uh, professionals that have found themselves in that situation. So it's, it's a good idea to try to prevent that. How you feel when you're trying to figure all this out. Um, you know, it, it's pretty stressful. Um, th there's no doubt about it. And uh, I believe this is a poll question. And, you know, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but periodically we'll have polls uh that uh, we, we kind of want to get a pulse on as we go through this webinar. And I believe this is a this is one of them. Could be wrong though. I think I'm wrong. It's not a poll question. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. Tax planning. What is that? Essentially, what tax planning is, is what taxes am I even required to pay? And what structure, how can I set up the structure of my business to most efficiently pay those taxes? That's essentially what tax planning is. And this is how taxes work when you're self employed You've essentially got two main tax rates that you're dealing with. One, you've got income taxes. That's what you know. most people think of when, when they just hear taxes in general. These are bracketed. It's a mar they're marginal tax rates. So that means that different chunks of your income are subject to different tax rates, um, lower and higher tax rates. Now, you also have the self-employment tax. And essentially, it can get a little bit confusing because of the, you know, the, the verbiage of self-employment tax, but essentially what it is are Social Security and Medicare taxes. It's literally what the self-employment tax is. So it's a flat tax rate of 15.3%. When you're self-employed, like when you're a 1099 contractor, when you have your own business, everything like that, you pay the full 15.3% tax rate. However, when you're an employee, when you work for someone else, like as a W-2 employee, you still pay the self-employment tax in effect because you pay the Social Security and Medicare taxes. It's the same thing. The only difference is your employer pays half of it and you as the employee pays half of it. Just by law, you know, your employer is required to pay half of your Social Security and Medicare taxes. Uh, but when you're self-employed, you're on the hook for the full 15.3%. That's why taxes are so expensive when you have your own business. It's because of that extra you pay in the self-employment tax. And this, um, I, I believe this is an example, you know, generally of someone making $100,000. When someone is making 100 grand as an employee, after um, or 7,500 gets paid by the employer, 7,500 gets paid by the employee. But when you're self-employed, you pay the full 15,000. It's a big difference. This is generally how you come up or how you calculate your tax. You have your total revenue at the top here, which is all the money that your business makes. You know, every dime that flows through your business or flows to your business as income. Then you've got your tax deductions, which is you know essentially just a, a fancy way of saying business expenses. Then you get to your net income, and you're only taxed on your net income. You know you're not taxed on your total gross income that you know flows into your bank account. You're allowed to write off um, tax deductions and business expenses. But then you know once you do those calculations, you either have a profit, which is a positive number. You know if there's money left over after you've paid all your business expenses. Or you've got a loss, which means that you have more business expenses than you had an income from the business. 
Um, that's uh, it could be either or, and then either the profit or the loss flows to your tax return. You know, you you report this on your personal tax return, and your profits are subject to both the self employment tax, the fifteen point three percent, and the income tax. They're two completely separate taxes. What is an S corp? Before we even get into S corps, let's talk about legal structures. In, in other words, let's talk about business structures. These are entities, and these are formed with the state. Very generally, but most often, you need to form a business entity in your state of residence, especially small business owners. And that's typically where they need to form. So to form a legal structure, you go to your secretary of state's office. You would file, you know, articles of um, organization to, you know, create an LLC, essentially. An LLC is an entity. And um, that's what these are. LLCs, entities, uh, they're usually required to file an annual report, letting the state know that they still exist, you know, who manages the entity. This is not a tax return. Like, this is just a, an informational report you file with the state. Uh, and uh, the for setting up the entity and the informational forms that you file usually are done with the Secretary of State. That's a totally different group from you know, the, the taxing authority or the IRS. An S Corp is a tax election. It's not a business structure by itself. I know this sounds crazy because the name S Corp is in the name S Corp, but an S Corp is not a corporation. Not necessarily. It's a tax election. So the IRS just automatically assigns businesses a certain uh, default tax structure or, or default tax treatment. And LLC are automatically taxed the same way as sole proprietorships. You know, um, they're subject to the same tax rates. How you file your taxes are extremely similar. Um, LLCs, in terms of the in the IRS's eyes, are essentially sole proprietorships. You know, in in a in a tax context. But as an LLC, or if you have some sort of business structure set up, you have a right to ask the IRS to tax you under different tax rules, and that's what an S corp is doing. You're asking the IRS to tax your single member LLC under the rules of an S corp. Why are they great? Like, why would you even want to do this? One, S-Corps do not pay self-employment taxes on the business profit. So, but here's what that means. When you become an S-Corp, which is paperwork filed with the IRS, by the way, it's paperwork that you, you know, send into the feds. Essentially what happens is you become a W-2 employee of your own business, pretty much. Uh, now, of course, you're still the owner. Like, you know, you're, it's still your LLC. Um, you still own it. Like, you're still listed as the owner on the you know, company formation documents. But for tax purposes, you literally become a W-2 employee as well. And since you're an employee, you pay yourself a wage. Your business will literally pay you, you know, a W-2 salary, just like you'd make if you worked for someone else, like as a W-2 employee or you know, for some other company. But the cool thing about... S corps is that the only chunk of your earnings that is subject to the self employment tax, excuse me, is your salary, whatever you pay yourself in W 2 wages. So let's talk about how that works. You have your S corp revenue here at the top, which is just your, uh, your total gross revenue. And part of that money is paid to you in salary. That 15.3%, um, which is the self-employment tax that we were talking about earlier, another way to say that is payroll taxes. That's another um, another way to, to uh, define those taxes. So whatever salary you pay yourself is the only thing that's subject to that 15.3% self-employment tax. And then, of course, you have your expenses. Um, and what you're left over with is your escort profit or loss. Like, you know, these are essentially, you kind of think of this money as dividends almost. The technical name for this money, the escort profit, especially, are called distributions to yourself. But some people use the term dividends to kind of describe that. Um, and all of this, the, the salary, 
your S-corp profit or loss, all of this flows over to your personal tax return. All this information, you'll report it on your personal tax return. And then, of course, you pay the income tax on all of that money. And let's go through an example. Let's just, let's uh, see what's different tax-wise between an LLC by itself and an s -corp, or an LLC electing as an s -corp. For the LLC, they're making the same amount of money. They're making 160000 But you can't pay yourself any wages when you're an owner of an LLC or a sole proprietorship. <laughs> so all of your money here, the full hundred sixty grand, is subject to the self-employment tax. So, you know, you pay a boatload of taxes, like, you know, you pay $24,000 in the self-employment tax. The S-Corp, however, you are now a W-2 employee. So you get to pay yourself a wage. And you make the same amount of money. You, you still get to have $160,000 coming to you in total. But, but sixty grand of that $160,000 are wages, are paid to your personal bank account via a paycheck, via wages. And in this example, it's $60,000. For whatever reason, this person has determined that a $60,000 salary is a reasonable salary to pay themselves. The Only that 60 is subject to the 15.3%, the self-employment tax. So, you know, your, your tax drops from 24,000 to 9,000, which obviously is a huge difference. It's a $15,000 difference. So um, you pay less self-employment taxes in the, uh, in the S4. But then you still have a hundred grand in pass through profit, which is essentially the escort profit. That's what the hundred thousand dollars is. And you can still pay yourself, you can still pay that hundred thousand dollars to yourself via distributions. That's the technical name for it. So you save in taxes. In this situation, you save 15 grand in taxes, and you still have access to all of your money. It's the small business owner's best friend. They call the escort that. And essentially, the reason why they call it that is because it, it, it recognizes that not all of the income that you get from your business comes from you know active work in the business. Um, some of it is just simply a return and the efficiency that you obtain when you create a business and when you build it. And also, it, it recognizes that for a lot of small business owners, there's not some large suite of corporate owners. There's not there's not you know. Uh, several different types of uh, um, uh, structures, things like that. So therefore, you know, two layers of corporate taxation isn't, isn't necessary. Uh, the S-Corp recognizes all of that. Which one is best for you? Uh, like, should you have an LLC by itself or should you have an LLC with an S-Corp election? And since essentially LLCs are best for businesses with very little earnings. You're just starting now. You're not really sure if you're going to make money yet. Um, and if you earn quite a bit less than $60,000 each year, probably. And also, if you want a simple, just straightforward tax structure, and you don't have to worry about much at all, to be honest with you. S-Corps are best for people, generally, that earn more than $60,000 in profit. It's a little different depending on where you live, in what state you live in, but very generally, um, collective says around $60,000. Um, if you want to maximize your retirement savings, you know, like to be self-employed, the amount that you can contribute to in, in retirement increases um, oftentimes. And if you have enough money flowing through the business to make your payroll, like to make regular payroll runs. Getting the salary through the S-Corp is great, but how much do I know or how much do I pay myself? Like, how, how do I know how to even structure this salary? The IRS, because this is what people ask me, they'll say, okay, if I'm only subject to the self-employment tax on my salary, then why not just pay myself a super low salary? Why not just pay myself a dollar in salary and the rest, I pay myself out in distributions and I save a boatload of taxes. And the, the I what I have to respond with is because you're at risk for audit if you do that like you, the chances that you'll be audited uh, when you have a super low salary like that it are higher and it would be just harder to justify that low of a salary to the irs so what they say what the i what and by they i mean the irs say that, that it has to be reasonable 
you have to pay yourself reasonable compensation. And it's essentially a facts and circumstance argument. And kind of a general rule of thumb, and again, this is not exact. So um, you um, it, like don't rely on this number. You need a more sort of comprehensive and more in-depth in analysis, uh, you know, to even come up with an appropriate number. But generally, it's 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 accepted that anything between thirty-five and forty-five percent is acceptable. But again, um, that's just a rule of thumb. It's not exact. But when you have a tax professional, um, they might be able to help you um, pick a number and do some sort of analysis. On it. Let's talk estimated taxes. Uh, and honestly, I think that this is a pain for a lot of small business owners. I, I get a lot of uh, I, I talk a lot about this with uh, with uh, small business owners, and it's, it's always it always seems to be a pain for them. Generally. You should pay estimated taxes, which is essentially another word for quarterly taxes, is if you expect to owe a grand or more in tax liability. And that's usually people that are independent contractors, you know, people that are working on a 1099 basis, people that have their own businesses, of course, business owners, people who, who, people who are sole props, uh, and people that have some sort of ownership in an LLC. Why do I have to pay estimated taxes? Like, what are these things? What, what do they even mean? And, and you know, why do I have to pay them? Let's go through the basics here. The IRS wants you to pay to, a lot of people think that taxes are paid at the end of the year, but they're not. They're supposed to be paid throughout the year as you make money. So like as you earn, or receive income, you're supposed to pay money to the government, either through withholding, like through your paycheck that automatically gets taken out and paid to the government, or through estimated tax payments, which are just um, quarterly payments that you pay yourself to the IRS or to your state. Like we mentioned earlier, you need to make payments if you make if you expect to owe a grand or more in tax. And if you don't make these payments, um, at the end of the year, you could be charged a small penalty. You might even be charged a penalty, even if you're due a refund when you file your tax return. Even if you um, don't end up owing any taxes at all, you still are required to pay, in certain situations, you're required to pay estimated tax fund. They're doing a quarterly basis. So every quarter in mid-April, June, September, and January of the following year. You gotta make those payments. All right. How do you even, or, or what are some strategies to estimate these taxes? And you've got two, or well, this is, it's called the, the um, safe harbor rules. And essentially you've got two ways to calculate it and you, you can pay the lesser of the two. For one, as long as you get 90% of the current year's taxes in through estimated tax deposits, whatever you owe this year, then um, you generally won't be penalized. So you know, let's say that you owe a grand in taxes for the entire year. As long as you pay $900 of those taxes in quarterly payments, you should get penalized. And you can pay that extra $100 uh, that you owe in taxes at, you know, before April 15th or when you file your tax return by April 15th. The other way is if you pay at least 100% of last year's taxes. So like even if you... Let's say that if you owe you know ten thousand dollars this year, but you only but you owed five thousand dollars last year, then as long as you pay five thousand um, dollars throughout the year in estimated payments, you can uh, avoid a penalty, and you can pay the other five grand when you file your return. Okay, you can also do this for actual numbers. So literally, what you do here is you estimate your AGI, which is your adjusted gross income, is you um, you estimate, okay, how much do I expect to make this year? And how much do I expect to spend in business expenses? And you come up with this number. And essentially what you do is you multiply your AGI by your tax rates. Yeah. And usually it's best to go online and you know uh, go to some sort of you know trusted company to uh, or some sort of tax calculator to do this. Um, but essentially, you know, once you uh, do that multiplication and find out your your total taxes, 
you just divide your total taxes by four to determine what you should pay each quarter to the feds and to your state, if need be. Yeah, like I just mentioned, estimated taxes, they're not just for the federal government. It's not just for the IRS. A lot of states have them as well. For example, California has them. And um, you got to make estimated tax payments this year if you expect to owe at least 500 bucks or $250 if you're married. Um, and um, it's very similar to the safe harbor rules with how much you need to pay in taxes. Um, but you, you also have to pay quarterly taxes with California, just like you have to do with the feds. Um, and as you can see here, they've got uh, you know specific rules of how much money they want. What happens if I don't pay estimated taxes? Like what, ha what happens if I don't pay my taxes in general? So this is what happens, or this is kind of the difference between estimated taxes between a sole proprietorship and an escort. Um, is one with a sole prop or even an LLC, you don't have any W-2. You don't have any paychecks that you're getting paid. So you don't have any sort of withholding that's coming out of your checks. So you have to estimate your income, calculate it, and make your own payments. For an S-Corp, you're paying yourself as an employee. So, you know, part of your money is going through, you know, assuming, assume it needs to be going through a payroll processor. Uh, and you'll have tax withholdings that come out of that, come out of that money. You can even choose to increase your W-2 withholdings to account for other income. So, you know, let's say that you um, have rental properties that you need to pay income tax on the proceeds. Let's say you just have other income sources that you need to pay taxes on. You can increase your, your tax withholdings from your W-2 paycheck to, you know, cover those other areas of income. It's a convenient way to do that. What can you do now to make your 2024 pack tax payments low? That's a good question, right? We're in 2024. You should consider an escort, especially, you know, if you're solidly, if you're either, you know, at 60 grand or above it. And um, essentially, you, um, when you're self-employed this year, obviously, you want to maximize your take-home pay. And what we would do is now that we're kind of in the second quarter, we would essentially come up with a quarter two estimated tax deposit about for you. We'd calculate that um, just so you can pay it on time. And um, also, too, we'll elect the escort tax status for you. And our average member saves around $10,000. So um, it's definitely not bad. A lot of times that's, you know, close to 10% of some um, business owner's net income. And uh, of course, you got a team of tax pros available if you have, if you need questions or, or if, if you have questions or need support. And that can be particularly valuable when you have an S-Corp. You know, an S-Corp can be pretty complicated. And then of course, peace of mind, which um, a lot of times is I think even more valuable to people than money, than tax savings, is just knowing that things are handled and you uh, are, you know, being taken care of in a compliance standpoint. The tax savings of corpse, uh, of corpse, um, th that's funny. I meant to say, of course, but the, the tax savings of an escort are substantial, but um, running one is complex. There's more things you got to do. There's more administration. Um, there's more compliance issues that you got to deal with. So that's where collective comes in. And essentially what we would do is, of course, we'd form your business. First thing we do is set up an LLC. If you don't already have one, obtain your EIN number, file paperwork with the IRS to handle your escort collection, and um, take care of your registering your payroll account. And of course, just ongoing maintenance with your escort. Ongoing state compliance, you know, with payroll forms and things of that nature, uh, will give you a reasonable salary recommendation. Handle the payroll. Uh, also, we'll take care of your estimated tax deposits in the sense that we'll calculate them for you every quarter, so you don't have to worry about that. And um, we will file the S corp state and federal income tax return. And of course, just so you can have financial clarity throughout the year, we provide um, ongoing bookkeeping, monthly bookkeeping. So we'll give you reports every month. 
Um, and it's just a good idea to do. So you can just at any point in time, know how much money your business is making, you know, what your finances look like. Uh, so we keep you organized. Yeah. Are you thinking about switching to an escort? Now, I, I do believe that this is a full question. And if I'm right, yes, I'm I'm right this time. Thank, thank the stars. But yeah, we're we're curious. Like I, I, after you know hearing some information about that, are you thinking about switching to an escort? Give people just a little bit to answer. Oops. <laughs> Wendy is in. Andy already has that. Okay, well, most people are in. A, you know, a good over half of you guys are in. Some of you aren't sure yet, and um, a little bit, a, a chunk of you not quite yet, which is totally fine. And um, it's a good idea not to become an S corp until it's ready for you. So uh, that's totally fine. Now, essentially, I was as I was talking earlier, there are more um, just things you've got to juggle um, and take care of when you're an S corp, and. The good news is the collective handles it all. All the bookkeeping support, the S Corp setup, um, um, ongoing state compliance, all of that, and we'll take care of that. And essentially, uh, like we said, you know, we'll take care of setting up the business. Um, also, if you already have an LLC in place, we'll actually clean up your books for you to the beginning of the year. Um, so, uh, that's something to keep in mind too. Of course, ongoing back office support and taxes at the end. Oh, okay. This is another good question. And I, I believe this is another poll question. But uh, how much do you think collective costs per month? Oh, this is no poll. Okay. Um, well, I'll tell you anyway. It's three forty nine a month. Um, well, Wendy on, in the chat, she guessed four hundred dollars. So I'm I'm glad that we're less than what you thought. Um, we're three forty nine a month, and uh, we're an at will contract. And essentially, when you first come on board, usually there's a one time one ninety nine onboarding fee, um, and um, that covers actually backdating your S corp election if you have an LLC in place, clean up your bookkeeping and everything like that. But then from there, it's just you know three forty nine a month if you go the um, uh, uh, the collective route. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry if if you go the month to month route. But this, so the onboarding fee, it, it's essentially it, it's a business success upgrade, and essentially what it covers, it's a one time fee, um, and essentially it. Verifies that your entity is in good standing. Make sure that it's you know in compliance and registered with the state. We'll set up or you know uh, transfer any payroll that um, is going on, and we'll do some catch up payroll. You know, let's say that you're already an S corp and um, you've been a little bit behind on your payroll. You know, we'll run some catch up payroll. But um, we'll also we'll we'll do we'll handle your employer registration with the state for the tax withholding, and um, if you're an LLC. We'll catch up and clean up your book, regardless of how complicated it is. Collective pays for itself. Um, so first of all, it's tax deductible. Collective is, you know, this is a business expense. But also, you know, we before we even sign anyone up for collective, we have a conversation with them. And if we don't think that collective is a good fit for them, or if we don't think that financially it would benefit them then you know we tell you so and we don't 
you know, we kind of give some loose guidance on maybe you should wait on an S corp and wait on collect. Uh, but essentially, if you're in a certain income level, it's very likely that the money that you'll save with an S corp will be well above collective fee for the year. All right. First off, schedule the call with us. Uh, you, by being an attendee of this webinar, you get uh, your first month half off, which of course, you know, everyone loves that. Everyone loves discounts. And um, essentially, before you even join Collective, you'll have a conversation with us to even see if we'd be a good fit for you, to even see if you need to be an escort. And then um, if you do, you know, we can discuss next steps and about how you get started. But for now, we have our Q&As. So let's get going. So Carl has a question. Very, okay. So I'm currently a new owner of two adjacent commercial properties in California. Would it make sense to put the properties into separate LLCs for greater liability protection? Put them both into a single S corp, or put the LLCs into a revocable trust. Well, I have no idea, no idea about trust, so I'll, unfortunately, I won't be able to answer that part. But in terms for just general advice, and again, like it's a good, especially for complex structures like this, it's a good idea to talk to a, to a tax attorney or even some sort of real estate attorney before you do this, because um, they'll know more than me. But just some general advice is it's usually a good idea to group together properties. To for properties that have a high amount of equity in them, meaning that let's say that the property property is worth a lot and you have a, a small loan balance in a certain property, then it's a good idea to put those in their own LLCs and keep them out of out of LLCs with properties that have a lot of loan balances on them or that aren't paid off or have no equity in them. And the reason why is let's say that you had an an LLC at the top, and you had a property under the same LLC, you had two properties, and one property had $400,000 in equity, and the other property had zero equity. If anything happened, like let's say that someone slipped and fall in the property with zero equity and sued you, they could technically go after the assets of the other property, even if it's unrelated or anything like that, because it's still under the same LLC. So it's usually a good idea to separate it out group together properties under the same LLCs that have high loan balances and no equity and keep properties separate in separate LLCs that have high equity. If I do an LLC, this is a great question, Wendy. If I do an LLC, how hard is it to change to a sub chapter S later? Not very hard at all. So essentially what you got to do is file a form, but you can absolutely start off in an LLC. And let's say that you know, you're not sure how much money you're going to make your first year or, you know, you're not sure that you, an escort would benefit you the first year. Yeah, go ahead and set up an LLC and you can always elect the escort status either later, um, later in the year, or, and you could technically, for, so for example, let's say that you wanted to set up an LLC now. And let's say that, you know, this the second half of the year, you've made a bunch of money and you're like, oh, I should have been an escort. If you join Collective within a certain time period, we'll actually be able to backdate your S-Corp S -corp election to July 1st of this year. So any money you've made since July 1st, we should be able to rope it into the S-Corp tax rules if you have an LLC in place. So yes, you can get the LLC set up, and then later on, you can elect the S-Corp tax status if it would be beneficial for you. Wendy's got another good question. If I have an LLC in Michigan, can I transfer it to Georgia? We've got a couple options when it comes to transferring LLCs. One, you can do something called a foreign registration. And essentially what a foreign registration is, is it takes it would take the LLC in Michigan and you'd foreign register that LLC in Georgia. And that that use, and again, I'm not a tax attorney, so it's a good idea to speak to a lawyer before you do any of this. But usually that satisfies the compliance requirements in Georgia. Now, but that, well, that, but that still, what happens though is that your Mich if you do a, a foreign registration, your Michigan LLC stays in existence, and you then also so you have to file you know annual reports. You still got to you know take care of that, 
but then you've got a, an, also an LLC presence in Georgia that you got to take care of. Now, you can also straight up move your LLC, which I, I believe this is, this is called something like a, a domestication or convert or something like that. And essentially, you shut down. It's a process to where your Michigan LLC is shut down, and it sort of springs up into Georgia. But I would get some guidance of, of an attorney before you did anything like that. Another good question for Carl. With Collective, do you do all of our tax returns, or would we still retain our previous tax account for personal returns, et cetera? Yes. If you still wanted your personal return handled by a professional, you would retain your um, uh, tax account if you had one. Now, keep in mind, though, because you're right. Collective would only file the S-Corp tax return. We wouldn't file your personal. Now, keep in mind, though, that when you become an S-Corp, your personal return, theoretically, should become more simple, should be easier to file. And the reason that is, is because when before you become an escort, if you're a sole proprietorship, an LLC, or anything like that, then all of your write-offs and business information and everything like that, that, that happens on your personal return. All of that is recorded on your personal return on your Schedule C, so it makes it more complicated. But now that you're an S-Corp, all of your business information will be recorded on your S-Corp tax return. It becomes the complicated one, and uh, that's the one that Collective would be filing. But after we filed that one, we would give you what's called a K-1 form. And you can think of the K-1 form as kind of like a, a W-2 form for your business. You take the K-1, and you essentially just plug and chug a few numbers on it on your personal return, and it's done. And you can usually do that pretty easily on a you know a site like TurboTax or something like that if you didn't want to worry about paying a CPA to handle it. Ooh, here's a good question. Who pays federal tax? The employee or the escort? Well, both technically. So technically how it works in an accounting standpoint is, and even if you're the only, like the sole employee owner of an escort, both you and the S Corp itself pays tax, or, or no, I'm sorry, pays federal tax. So essentially, let's say that you know you have a hundred thousand dollars, and you pay yourself a forty thousand dollars salary. Let's just assume that that's a reasonable salary. How you'd come up the self employment tax that need to be paid would be forty thousand dollars multiplied by fifteen point three percent. So what is that? That's that's six thousand one hundred twenty dollars. And technically, how it works from an accounting standpoint is ha half of that $6,120 is paid by the employee, by you, because you're the only employee, and half of that is paid by the escort. But both ultimately get sent over to the federal government, so it's essentially the same thing. I am already a multi-owner LLC. Should we turn our existing LLC into an escort or create a new escort that owns the existing LLC? Honestly, Monique, that's a good question, but unfortunately, that's impossible for me to answer because I just don't know enough about your situation. Usually, and, and again, I, I know I keep meeting, I, I know I keep saying this, but talk to a tax attorney, you know, before you do anything, talk to a tax professional. But most of the time, if you already have an LLC in place, even if it's a multi-member LLC, you can just make an escrow collection on that LLC. But yes, there are some people that choose to do. Uh, like, you know, create new business structures that in new management company structures. So again, it's a good idea to talk to the question before you do it. Richard has a good question. I'm an LLC, but Tennessee does have a 6.5% franchise tax on entities. Would it be worth it for me to switch to an S1? I would be saving on tax. However, I would have to turn around and give 6.5% to Tennessee. You are absolutely right, Richard. Unfortunately, there are certain states that have excise taxes. There's certain states that have general corporation taxes, and there's a tax in New York that's actually called it's called the general corporation tax, and it's around uh, an eight or above percent tax on the the business net income. So yeah, in Tennessee you do have that extra tax, but it just kind of depends. I mean, it it depends on your level of income and kind of where you are. At at one point of income, it might not be worth it to you because you're just kind of giving it away to Tennessee, but at another point of income the amount that you save on the federal side could possibly overtake 
the, the additional taxes in Tennessee. So it would still be worth it. And it just kind of depends, you know, like you just kind of need to do an analysis or you know, talk to a tax professional about it. Um, because it, it, it might still be worth it for you to do it. Well, these were excellent questions, and I believe I got through them all. But all of you are very smart, very tu intuitive, um, and excellent questions. And I think that's it. Um, so yeah, that uh, that essentially concludes our webinar today. And um, it was a blast. I have a blast every time I do one of these. I, I love uh, speaking to small business owners and, and answering their very insightful questions. But um, like I said, you know, we're here. We're around. If you'd like to you know, speak about your business, um, if you'd like to see if Collective would be a good fit for you, or if you should consider an s you know, schedule a call with one of our business advisors. And we'd be happy to, you know, walk through, you know, see what, you know, give you some, um, you know, suggested next steps. And we'll be honest with you as well. You know, we we do right by our clients here at Collective. And, you know, if we, um, if we don't um, think that Collective is in your best interest or an escort is in your best interest, we will tell you. And we'll send you some referrals and, you know, we'll, we'll uh, make sure that you're taken care of. And then Jay has a question. Will you follow up with a PDF? I need to reread the beginning part of the presentation. So unfortunately, I can't send an actual PDF copy of this presentation, but I will send a recording of this presentation. So if you're a, an email attendee, you will get an automatic um, email with this, um, of this recording. So you'll be able to go back. Uh, but that's all I've got. And, and like I said, I, I hope to see you know some of you in some meetings you know talking about your business situation. But if not... Um, I hope to see you again on the uh, on the next webinar, and I hope I wish everyone the best of luck with their business.